council was concerned about the fact that the waiting list was increasing and that people were waiting up to two years to complete their clinical assessment, which was we all just felt was not appropriate. Um, these people are trained physiotherapists overseas and to spend up to two years waiting to find out whether they can work here in Australia or not is actually a really big impact on their lives. So we thought, hmm, how can we do this in a more efficient manner? The reason the waiting list became about was because the hospitals only have a certain capacity to um, assess these people with real patients. Um, so we thought, hmm, how can we actually um, decrease that burden on the hospitals and therefore increase the throughput of people completing the assessments? Simulation is something we've been using in education to train undergrad physios and the evidence around training entry level physiotherapists was that we could replace up to 25% of their clinical time with simulated patients and simulation based education. So we thought, I wonder whether we could do that with assessments. At this point in time, there, or the time that we started the project, there wasn't any evidence that we could do this. So therefore we needed to actually do a research project to validate and say that actually this is an appropriate way to assess competency to practice in Australia. The council had a few aspects to the vision of embedding simulation based assessments in their um, application for a candidate to register in Australia. Aside from the waiting lists that we've already talked about, they also wanted to give candidates the opportunity for a more consistent assessment that the candidates actually knew what was expected of them in a, in a different manner. By running all the assessments in the one venue, we can give them a uh, much more thorough orientation to that, that is standard across all of the candidates, hoping to improve that experience. The council wanted to innovate and lead change across um, the healthcare sector in Australia and actually demonstrate that uh, new, in, new ways and models of assessment can lead to greater and better outcomes for everybody, the profession themselves, the um, candidates who are undergoing it uh, and the, the board at the end of the day as well, having a, a, a level of certainty around, yes, this person has been mapped across all the thresholds as being competent and therefore we have confidence that this uh, person is going to go on and be a, an excellent physiotherapist in Australia. At this point in time, the evidence for simulation-based assessments is limited, to be honest, which is part of the reason why the council wanted to embark on a research project. They wanted to contribute to the scientific understanding of simulation, um, both in terms of education and assessment in physiotherapy practice. There's currently no physiotherapy literature at all, so this is one of the first projects um, internationally that is validating simulation-based assessments for determining competency to practice in physiotherapy. In the medicine and the nursing and dentistry space, there is um, evidence that does demonstrate that this does uh, lead to uh, a valid measure of um, capabilities and also is very reliable. Um, it's just that they can't pull the results to have complete confidence at this stage because people have used simulation in many, many different ways. So uh, to be able to say confidently this is definitely the perfect thing to be doing is not possible at this stage. But again, that is why we're doing the large trial for the APC so that we can actually have confidence that in physiotherapy practice this is an appropriate measure. That is entirely the point of this trial. It's to validate it and determine that the performance on in a simulation does actually match with the performance on with a real patient. We have designed a project that has uh, candidates completing the simulation experience and then also completing a real patient. And we're taking the scores of performance in the simulation and comparing them to the scores of the performance with their real patient to see whether there's a significant relationship between the two. So are they, are they similar is the question we're asking. Um, and we're getting a large cohort of people, 150 people in total, um, who've done multiple assessments uh, for some of them to be able to look at the percentage of matches. So if you don't pass the simulation and you don't pass the real, that would be a match. Or if you pass the simulation and you pass the real with a patient, that would also be a match versus passing one and not passing the other. Is that a mismatch? And then looking to see the, the percentages and confirm that there's a significant number that do match. 
We brought into the project some key people who were experts in simulation, myself being one of them, and thank you to the council for um, bringing me onto the team because it's been a most interesting project to be part of. The people who were experts in simulation though were um, using simulation for education rather than assessment. So we did need to have some think tank discussions to go, well, here's what works in education and training physiotherapists, what will work if we use it as an assessment. We also looked at the literature around good design for assessment, whether it's simulation or written exams or other forms of practical um, examinations. So around looking at performance criteria and linking those performance criteria with the thresholds uh, of physiotherapy practice and then also looking at the fact that we have these thresholds so how can we make sure that we have assessed all of them. From there we then sort of discussed with the board of the council and the CEO of the, the council around um, how rigorous we wanted it to be because we could have done things in a slower fashion and the decision was actually made that no, we wanted to make sure that we were moving through the project in a timely fashion to um, ensure that the candidate's waiting list drops as quickly as possible and that we transform the experience the candidates um, were having as, as soon as possible. So from that, we then decided, well, we better not launch into this completely in a whole entire, let's just do it, start doing it. We actually initially involved candidates to complete simulation and real for everything. And we only looked at the real performance for the purpose of determining whether they can register as a physiotherapist in Australia. Um, and the simulation was very much considered to be experimental. Um, when we then found that there was a significant match between the two, we moved to stage two of the project where candidates actually didn't complete six exams because that was quite burdensome. They actually completed three simulations and one reel. So we could still continue to collect the matching. And at that point in time, we transitioned to a uh, model where the simulation actually contributed towards whether you were able to register as a physiotherapist in Australia or not. Um, and that was quite the, the first wonderful milestone actually. There was um, a lot of steps along the way to do with recruiting actors, designing and writing cases and finding experts around Australia to write those cases and, and map them to the thresholds. We need to come up with a, a model and we now have a giant spreadsheet for every single case that the candidate completes and how it relates to the thresholds for, for practice in Australia and different combinations of patient cases that go together. We came up with a model for training actors, which was based on what we were doing in education and also um, the literature on simulated patient methodology so that it was the whole entire process has been grounded in um, the evidence for and the most rigorous way possible in a pragmatic situation. At the time that we even book the particular assessment for a candidate, we don't know what patient they're going to see. We don't know um, whether that particular patient will allow them to demonstrate competency. Uh, even when the, when the candidate arrives in the morning, potentially if something happens with the patient that the therapists or the assessors have decided is going to be the patient, they could change patients again at the last minute. So from a, an ability to actually have consistency in the assessment, there are some significant challenges um, for using real patients. Not to mention as well that we're actually asking people that we don't know their capabilities to demonstrate practice with these patients. So there's an element of safety and risk for, um, for patients in having these um, candidates demonstrate their competency. And of course, simulation completely removes all of that. Um, it gives us a much more controlled environment. We map the three different cases that the, the candidate works through across the three core areas in, of practice um, to the threshold standards that a therapist needs to demonstrate in Australia, guaranteeing that the candidate has an opportunity to demonstrate everything and guaranteeing that the council has the opportunity to assess them across all aspects of practice before making a final decision. We can't guarantee that with real patients because we don't actually know what patient they're going to see until the moment they walk in the room. 
The main advantage to this form of assessment is being able to do consistent patient cases that we know are the same between candidates. It's far more equitable and fair to have a case that has been mapped to the other cases that you're experiencing, so it's not just some random patient. Um, we know what's going to unfold in the real world. A patient could all of a sudden start vomiting all over the candidate and we have no control over that and that can really throw a candidate off. Whereas any, um, I guess, adverse events that we want the candidate to demonstrate how they manage have been written into the script and the actors have been trained on how to portray that so that the candidate, we know what each candidate's going to be experiencing and it's consistent between candidates. The um, other absolute advantages are things like uh, we get to pick what day the candidates are able to be assessed on, um, whereas the hospitals tell us when they're available. Um, there's no interruptions, unlike in the hospital, if the doctors walk in, the doctors walk in and, and the assessment can have issues with that. Um, and of course the examiners being able to see the same scenario and the different candidates, it's much easier for them to be able to say, well, this candidate actually meets thresholds and this one doesn't because it is the same case. With a different patient that unfolds in different ways, you haven't got that level of confidence as an assessor that this person really does or does not meet the performance criteria. Because physiotherapy is such a, um, a profession that relies on um, movement and observation to come up with uh, clinical decision making processes, um, there has been reservation over the last decade from the profession around whether simulation truly can do it. And in fact, I recall um, about five years ago when we were rolling it out in the education space that Clinicians, particularly working in certain areas where um, deviation from normal movement is such a significant component of um, how they interact and why they interact with patients. They were very, they were very reserved. It was interestingly though, because I sort of said, well, maybe just give it a moment to actually see how it unfolds before you pass judgment. And those therapists then came in and spent a week with the students doing a simulation in, in the particular area of practice. And at the end of that, they went, oh, wow, this actually, I felt like I was supervising students on clinic. These actors are just amazing in how they portray the roles. So perhaps my response initially is that we actually, we go a long way to trying to make sure that the um, scenarios as they unfold in the simulation are as close to real life as possible and that we invest a lot of energy and the actors are so passionate that they really want to fill the role to the best of their ability. Um, come and experience it. Come and see, come and be the therapist. If you have any opportunity to see a simulation unfolding, it might then actually um, open a new door for you and, and you might see something that you didn't think was possible and suspend reality yourself and feel like that this actually really is a real patient even though you know it's not. And then after that, if you've still got reservations, let's talk more about how to do it better. So far to date, we've run some preliminary analyses to make sure that this is um, the right thing to be doing um, from an ethical point of view with the candidates and significant matches are occurring. So we can't wait to get to the end um, to be confident that there's a significant match and that this does actually provide us with a valid measure. We're also looking at the reliability, so the consistency between um, candidates within this and uh, again preliminarily it appears to actually have um, significant findings but we need to wait until those um, the full sample size is collected to be then completely confident and um, I'm excited that we're not actually too far away from that and that um, we will be presenting at these international conferences um, around the final results and, and demonstrating the validity of simulation based assessments for physio practice. 
You become a global leader when you are one of the first people to publish in a peer-reviewed journal that you found something that is a significant potential change for the future. The um, results of this particular trial we will be publishing in an international journal for everybody in physiotherapy to read and learn from and then start implementing if they feel appropriate or alternatively build upon. Um, we don't have to have all the answers at this stage but it's great to be the people who are starting the conversation and triggering new fantastic ideas for others around the globe to actually build on the, the foundational research that we've done at this point in time. Um, and as soon as you actually create that foundation, you then connect globally with other people as well. And people turn to you to say, well, what can we learn from your experience? And I think that's what true leadership is about, inspiring others for change and having a passion to inspire change to do things better and supporting others then to go on. And I think that is exactly what the council is going to be really well positioned with the results of this project, to support and lead future innovation in simulation-based assessments.